Hi, so I'm Dave, and um, uh, I thought we'd um, each of us talk a little bit about what brings us to the uh, uh, to this particular uh, COE and to the internet uh, community in general. Uh, I research IoT and uh, systems for smart grids and virtual power plants. Uh, at least that's what I'm doing currently. But I, I also have an interest in the uh, in the healthcare industry and a hobby interest in uh, home IoT. Uh, Evelyn, do you want to talk a little bit about why you're here? Yes. So um, my passion and my uh, professional focus is privacy. Um, I've had my head up in the clouds for some time now. Um, I feel very strongly about the need to empower individuals over their data and also for um, privacy to be much more linked with uh, security as we move forward in developing standards and, and, and considerations for privacy in IoT. George? Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, thanks, Evelyn. Um, so uh, my name is George Young. Uh, I work for CBT. Uh, so we, uh, our company uh, spends a lot of time and have been has a lot of experience regarding uh, working in the IoT field, specifically industrial IoT. We've done a lot of work for quite a few years now where we have operational sites uh, in the uh, industrial area, um, specifically oil and gas at the moment. And, um, you know, so developing, implementing those is really uh, key to what we're doing as an organization. I would also say for me as a, as a cybersecurity guy um, that, you know, uh, the security element of bridging IoT and OT is really of interest to me and our organization and how how that is emerging and the things this, um, that are being put in place today. Uh, we have a way to go, but um, that's the reason for my interest and my organization's interest is to uh, um, support, help, and learn uh, along the way uh, regarding the IoT and specifically industrial IoT. Uh, great, thanks very much, George. So this is the um, the charter, if you will, for the uh, Security, Privacy, and Trust Center of Excellence. Uh, much of it centered on uh, um, creating awareness and advocating security and privacy by design. Uh, as uh, we probably all have heard, uh, security and privacy are kind of like the uh, lost children of uh, the internet uh, have been for for quite a long time, and and we know that uh, with the stakes. Uh, that we see in IoT and specifically uh, in the integration with things like cyber physical systems where consequences have physical uh, uh, consequences, uh, then uh, we know we have to uh, uh, practice uh, security and privacy by design. Um, I also want to uh, 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 invite people to go to iotpractitioner.com to see some of what's going on in this area. Uh, this is a uh, set of uh, proposed um, areas of focus for uh, this particular cent uh, center of excellence. I won't go through this, uh, but um, uh, a lot is involved here and a lot of this has to do with uh, interactions, I think, with other areas in um, in uh, the IoT community, such as I, I know there are um, there are uh, centers of excellence focusing on things like digital twins and interaction models, uh, basically use cases for systems of IoT, uh, virtual devices, uh, composite devices, all of those kinds of things. Um, and there's also a big issue that, that, that we're focusing on and legacy devices. Uh, that's always in the adoption of any new set of uh, global uh, 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 standards, uh, legacy devices generally get um, uh, get involved in uh, a lot of complexity. And uh, so we need strategies for some of those things. But um, uh, in any case, I think uh, what um, uh, we should do is let's just get into it and start talking about a few questions. Uh, we've heard, many of us have heard customers and clients talk about some of the security, privacy, and trust issues uh, and about standards and regulations. And many people really don't know where to begin. I've had recent 
um, uh, clients, uh, partners who are in the virtual power plant uh, business are wanting to um, integrate BPPs. And um, you know, they've got devices. Uh, they want to be able to uh, integrate them into uh, you know, a, a much more proactive system, a much more re a responsive system. But even things like identifying those devices, understanding what their capabilities are, where the data goes that they collect, all of those kinds of things. Uh, there aren't any standards and there's, there's hardly any uh, uh, you know, prior art, so to speak, to, you know, to, to go by, um, but there's a lot of opportunity. Um, but um, let's start maybe with the positives. The IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act of 2020 was a landmark accomplishment for the IoT industry. Uh, George, what was the impact of this legislation on the uh, industry and what has occurred since it's passed and where are we going to go from here? Yeah, thanks, David. Yeah, so the, the, um, the act itself was really um, planting a flag in the ground. You know, it was a much needed legislation. It really um, it specifically deals with the federal government as most standards come out, right? I mean, you can go back in the old days of TCP IP and Ethernet and all that kind of stuff like that, the OSI model. But um, really, it's a, uh, it's a way to bring together um, a standard, an open uh, environment where uh, manufacturers, um, as they uh, work with the federal government in this case, um, can um, develop standards. And then we can move towards an area where um, we can better um, serve um, our customers, our clients with um, security and, and privacy. Uh, with the technology that's in place, everybody working towards marching towards a uh, a single point, if you will. Uh, you know, there's other organizations or other standards out there that, at the state level, California and Oregon, they um, propose some, um, or actually, they've got some uh, laws on the books right now regarding that. I think it's a, uh, it's it's one of those things where the legislature is trying to catch up to the technology, um, and specifically. Um, dealing with, you know, like I said before, in our area with CBT, we, um, we deal with the industrial side. So now you're talking about operational technology, something that's been in place for, for years prior to this whole, um, you know, cybersecurity issue uh, coming, coming into play. Now, now with the merging of those two, um, it's really significant right now because lives are at stake regarding just simply an, an IT infrastructure. So I think really, you know, what's nice about the legislature of the 2020 Act is that it's not just a um, standard or static piece of documentation. So what I'm saying, what I mean by that is that every five years they have to review this. And I like that concept where the bill gives the freedom to evolve. And I think that's really, really key, especially in the technology field where we're going right now, because as you guys well know, every five years, oh my God, technology changes so quickly. Um, but I think really it's one of those things where, um, you know, it's really important that we have a, a working towards a common goal so that we can, you know, uh, protect um, uh, the, the infrastructures that are out there. And really the number one goal is, is safety and, and privacy. You know, those, those are the two goals, if you will. But uh, where we're going right now, I, I would say I would not be uh, surprised to see further legislation down the road. Um, you see some happening right now with the 8259, which I'm sure we're going to touch on a little bit later on, where it gets into more of the technical aspect of it, uh, which is really, really important. But um, I think you're going to see more of a broadening of that and, um, and some specifics are needed. Right now, it's a great overview um, framework, if you will. But uh, the specifics, you know, the devil's in the details, if you will. Right. Evelyn, do you want to chime in a little bit on the uh, Cybersecurity Act and, uh, and uh, how, how you see uh, it for privacy and other aspects? Uh, thanks so much, David and, and George. Yeah, so building on what George said, I do also like the fact that this gets, you know, reviewed every five years. I think one of the common themes I'm seeing with cybersecurity regulation is that a lot of it still remains very infrastructure driven. And today in a data driven world um, where data is essentially fueling so much of what we do, especially in this industrial IoT context, 
um, that's the direction I feel like we have an opportunity to be headed with with standards. Um, also, the second point that I kind of feel quite strongly about is that quite often the standard makers and technologists sit on opposite sides of the fence. And quite often we see with them, you know, an ever growing number of legislation um, and, you know, new frameworks is that they dovetail and intersect with each other. And sometimes they contradict each other, which makes it very problematic for the implementers of these. So um, I'm looking forward to greater harmonization in that space. Oh, great. So one of the things that I uh, saw in the, uh, in the act was uh, specific directions to NIST uh, and other agencies, but NIST in particular with respect to uh, setting up uh, obviously standards uh, for uh, security. Um, what has happened is, is that NIST has provided, I think, some very good guidelines uh, for the kind of capabilities that uh, IoT devices should have in order to ensure safety, uh, uh, privacy, and, and uh, security. Um, but uh, the problem is, is that those uh, specific guidelines so far don't address uh, any of the issues that are really gnarly, uh, including things like interoperability and something we mentioned earlier, such as legacy devices. Uh, a lot of the devices out there, and you know, the, the term has sort of disappeared a little bit, the trillions of sensors. Uh, it was a kind of a, a movement a, a while ago, but there are trillions of sensors now. And, and um, uh, those devices are IoT devices. They get integrated into these systems. Uh, and um, you know, how do we treat them from a security, privacy, and trust point of view? And I think privacy is actually one of the really biggest issues, obviously, with sensor devices. Um, so we've got to start, at least, you know, with the Cybersecurity Act. And there are people who are uh, responding uh, and uh, providing, I think, some good guidance, but they're just baseline capabilities that we're talking about, no standard ways for providing them and, and, and pra no practical interoperability. There are places where I think that, that, uh, 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 that we've seen uh, proposals uh, not broadly implemented, uh, but uh, for machine to machine interaction and things of that sort. Uh, but if you take a look at the capabilities that NIST is promoting right now, uh, they go way beyond machine-to-machine -machine interaction. And, and to their credit, they have an emphasis on, um, uh, uh, on systems, um, not just interactions between one machine and another, but systems of uh, devices and uh, how those systems need to be secured and how those systems pass data uh, amongst the, the, the different elements. Um, George, since there are no current global IoT security standards in place for manufacturers to abide by, what actions might different people, different organizations, and for that matter, consumers uh, insist on to protect themselves until we get some of those standards? Yeah, I, you know, that's a great question. The um, Yesterday, Julian, uh, from your organization, InterTrust, did a really fantastic job in, in laying out some of the um, steps that you could take to mitigate the issues, if you will. You know, there's different scenarios regarding the enterprise or industrial versus the consumer side, right? I mean, there's, you know, there's um, from, you know, from a legal standpoint, the whole liability thing on the enterprise side. So you have to, you have to take these extra steps to make sure, but uh, that you're um, protected, not only for your organizational shareholders and, and such, but uh, it's really, you know, I'll speak from a, an enterprise standpoint, the, uh, it's really um, the idea of, first of all, you need to make sure that you have an idea, what, what do you have? Um, an inventory of, of the items themselves, because we get into an area of the unknown. As we know, sometimes uh, devices or items show up unexpect unexpectedly on a infrastructure and you're like, what the heck is that? And then why, why are we having a problem with this particular area or device that shouldn't even be on our network? So an inventory uh, of, of the network is, is key, understanding what do you have itself. Um, so identifying the device you know, itself, um, being able to, the authentication and authorization of those devices, everything 
you know, here's the here's the issue with IoT devices. Some of them have the capability of putting software on them, and you can you can patch them, which patching is really key and and uh, to uh, making sure that you're up to date. I I can't tell you how many times that the issue that um, that people organizations have is because they haven't had a um, a policy or procedure regarding um, staying current with their patching and the updates themselves. But as you say, legacy items, legacy IoT devices. Um, Sometimes they don't have the intelligence where you can do the patching, so you you run into that you know kind of stare. Now in on the industrial on the you know, OT side, you know you've got protocols, so you've got different protocols that are out there, and so how do you mitigate that? Really, the those the obstacle there is is all these different protocols, but there's ways to do that, and we can touch upon that maybe a little bit later. But um, protecting the data, you know, is key. You know, I you know you gather the data. Um, from these sensors, what do you do with the data in transit? Is it encrypted? How's it stored? How's it stored at rest? Uh, those are those are important elements that you need to to make sure that the that the data is not only secure, but is it um, is it valid? Um, has it has it been touched? Has there been a man in the middle attack? So you need to make sure you have mitigation issues. The other thing too is to take an account is like assume that you will have a breach, which is a terrible thought, but what mitigations have you uh, taken to uh, remediate uh, the issue? Um, have you done backups? What have you done with the, the data? How far back can you go? If there is a tech like Colonial Pipeline, I mean, do you have a backup systems in place? Do you have the information stored? You know, where you have a timestamp that you can go back to and rely on to uh, make sure that, you know, you only lost so, so much data. Um, so you have to be careful about that. And then there's the, you know, getting into security or privacy, which is Evelyn's area of expertise is like in a hospital environment, HIPAA, you have to be concerned about that, you know, patients records and things. So there's a lot that you have to take into account and there's um, different ways that you can mitigate it. One of the big, you know, areas right now is zero trust. Don't trust until you verify. And so I think that's really key to, you know, how you go about it and taking steps to make sure that you can authenticate, authorize the, um, the, the, um, the data, the sensors, the information that's coming in, because the information will flow. But if somebody compromised that IoT device in the beginning and they're part of the flow, traffic flow, you still have bad data coming through. You have, an, you know, the... the the area you have been, um, uh, you know, the visit, um, the um, the item, if you will, the sensor has been the vulnerability, if you will, has been exploited, and so you get into an area while well, they're already inside the network, and then then you have a problem. Yeah, yeah, you bring up uh, zero trust, and and that's an area that I found has really confused a lot of people. Um, I think actually it's a bad term to use, although in the right context, it's perfect. And that is uh, the context of uh, not relying on, not trusting the net. Um, so you make your security system and your privacy by design uh, independent of uh, the network configuration, independent of, uh, you know, in fact, you don't even know what networks uh, devices are connected to anymore. So it's almost impossible to analyze. So we don't have any choice than to design systems whose security and privacy are, are independent of the network. Um, but um, it's not really zero trust is what you get. You still have to rely on all kinds of things. And a little later on, maybe we can discuss about the, the human factors aspect of all of this. How do people actually know what they're relying on and, and what they aren't relying on? Right, right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you get into the whole, right, the concept of um, depth and, you know, uh, and def you know, defense and depth, if you will, kind of like the, the layered approach. Um, you know, configurations of, of these devices, are they validated? Has anything changed? You know, it's one of those things where as a, a security guy, I look everything from a paranoid point of view and that's where I start. And that's, so that's for me, zero test trust takes on that kind of a meeting itself, but your points are valid. Yeah. So, um, Evelyn, how do you, users feel about the fact that approximately by some estimates 150 million discrete data points are maybe collected about them daily to sort of get the focus back on people again from a security perspective how does this create more entry 
points for hackers and how can people understand what is happening to all of this data? Uh, that's, a, that's an area that I, I know you're really concerned about. So, you know, it's an interesting thing because before um, George brought up this idea, you know, that inventorying what's on your network and as part of, you know, a privacy impact assessment that, you know, um, at the time, you know, an organization is looking to deploy IoT or, you know, make significant changes in the way they set up. One of the things I think a critical step is the inventorying of data, you know, what types of data you know, are being collected? How are they being correlated against each other? Um, and, you know, looking at the flow and touch points, mapping out those APIs is a critical thing, which, you know, both has strong, done correctly, I think it provides strong privacy protection as well as security protection. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the interesting things is, you know, when I look at IoT in an industrial context and the way it may expose individuals. I'm going to use this, you know, just example. So take as an example, someone working in an industrial context and they are operating some machinery. So some correlation is done against them to figure out the likelihood that they might have a heart attack or have some sort of physical injury or ailment in their role operating critical machinery. Um, that has very strong what I call profiling connotations. And that's where some individuals might become very concerned about, you know, does it mean that now I'm being profiled as being in a high risk factor? And will that also have other spinoff effects? May it affect my insurance premiums down the line? Mm -hmm. um, or if, you know, you're uh, um, someone who's a consumer of, um, an industrial IoT and you have, you know, there's data floating out about you about your usage of uh, certain types of resources. And that, you know, becomes a way that you might be identified as being in a certain geography, being of a certain age group, um, you know, and targeted for other, in other ways that you may have not expected. One of the things that people can do about this is today, one of the things that I think is working very well with regulations is giving end users the opportunity to exercise their right to be forgotten, their right to data portability, their right to know what an organization is collecting about them. And I think that this is something, it's probably a longer topic than now, so I'm just gonna skim past it, but this is something that, you know, maybe in a future session we could dive into about how this can provide greater transparency for end users in an IoT context. Oh yeah, definitely. I think we should, we should do that. And I, I'd also add that um, in, in terms of creating awareness, uh, we get anecdotes periodically in the, in the Regulators sometimes even respond to some of these, you know, more egregious anecdotes. Uh, you know, I, 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 one of the books I like and recommend in this area uh, is Bruce Schneier's book, uh, provocatively entitled uh, Click Here to Kill Everybody. Uh, and uh, he talks about uh, his course at Harvard when he uses a doll. Uh, I think it's named uh, My Friend Kayla. And uh, he invites people from the audience, typically are, a lot of them are, are, are actually technology naive and, and uh, to act, start hacking the doll from their seats and uh, just gives them a few hints. And it turns out that, you know, the Bluetooth interface is wide open and uh, you can uh, easily just uh, establish a connection from your phone and see everything that the doll, uh, the doll senses, uh, video, uh, audio, et cetera. Uh, a neighbor can do that, um, et cetera. That led to, you know, this particular toy being banned, uh, regulatory body, I, I've forgotten which one actually has, has banned it. Uh, but uh, I don't know if there's any systematic way whereby those kinds of things are, are addressed. Um, now, sometimes I think there's a more systematic approach to these things. I recently moved from California to actually now it's two years uh, ago to, to Pennsylvania. 
And in signing a, a, a contract, a purchase contract, uh, one of the things that was addressed specifically in the purchase contact, contract was, in effect, a, a, a cybersecurity clause recognizing that homes nowadays have all kinds of IoT devices, sensors and things of that sort uh, connected uh, into them, and uh, at least warning people that you, you, they, there's security cameras that might be all over the place and on the property uh, you should find out about. Uh, or the, you should have assurance that those kinds of things are, are disconnected. Um, but again, the problem is, is, is that people, it, you know, you, you can mandate a lot of these kinds of things, but actually executing them, giving people the savvy to, to deal with them is not quite there yet. So we've got good intentions, but, um, you know, I think uh, the human-centered trust issue that I'm talking about is, is still uh, pretty far behind. Um, uh, you've uh, addressed some of the uh, issues with unwanted profiles, uh, Evelyn, um, and, um, and I just talked about some of the regulatory issues that, uh, that, that are, are coming up and, you know, what happens with regulators sometimes is they just, you know, say, well, at least put some people on notice, uh, and, uh, you know, we, we all been annoyed incessantly with the, uh, the cookie, uh, you know, we've got cookies and, and, and you've got to agree to our cookie pro uh, policy if you want a decent uh, uh, experience on our website. Uh, what, what, what's your feeling about the issues of terms and conditions, notices and things of that sort? Uh, is there any way of going beyond that to be more effective without being uh, also too invasive? You know, it's very interesting you should bring that up. I think that the, you know, like you said, the, the these pop-ups that pop up, and in some cases, some vendors are forcing you into accepting those rather than giving you the option to decline all. Or, um, and I do think it is highly invasive. I think we need to move to a model two things. One is that, um, Terms and conditions needs to be more pictorial for end users to be able to better digest what it means. Today, mm -hmm. most end users are not you know, necessarily tech savvy. And when they get this, their inclination is just to click whatever it takes to get rid of it so they can get to what they want without really understanding it. The second thing is that I think we're going to have to look, you know, hopefully that this thing of cookies is now with some of the moves that are in place is hopefully moving away. But as we move forward to sort of more user authenticated, if you will, consent, it definitely needs to be put into terms which are not 13 or 26 page notices that people must funnel through, but rather something that is expressed in a universal language, which is a which is potentially pictorial with some wording so that it can be better digested by end users. Cool. And uh, George, your, your company specializes in technology with a, a human touch. And um, I, I know um, you've looked at technologies and solutions for protecting workers. Um, and um, I, I noticed we actually have a q and A in this area right now from uh, Ahab, uh, and who says typically resources and headcount are uh, is not enough. Uh, should this be an IT or an OT function? To uh, if it's a OT function, what resources and headcount expected to to be added to OT to uh, to handle this? How how can we again more systematically deal with this, particularly in a, a uh, uh, an industrial environment uh, uh, where we want to respect the rights of employees? Yeah, so I would say there is really, you know, that's one of those questions where you say it depends, right? <laughs> and so you get into it depends. And that's the answer that everybody hates and doesn't want to hear, right? So really it's about methodology. So within our organization, um, and it's much more than just a, a, a tagline um, technology with the human touch. I mean, we, it's really our charter. It's really what we're our culture within the organization um, that was started by our um, CEO, Kelly Ireland, and it propagates itself throughout the organization, but also it also carries itself 
very strongly in in the uh, when we we deal with customers or um, some organizations that aren't customers, and we'll we'll invest quite a bit of resources even before we start uh, with a solid relationship, and we we have a methodology, and our methodology is is something we call a quick start, where we get into the world of you know, since our world is really bridging between IT and OT, and it's really, you know, the cultures are so different and diverse. Um, it's not only the technology, but it's also the individuals, right? You have, um, I kind of liken it back to the days of IBM versus everybody else, you know, SNA versus TCP IP. You know, you have this, um, this cultural dynamic that's in place that you have to uh, to bridge. And back in the day, I I had the um, fortune of uh, working for an organization that was doing interoperability between the, the different protocols. And so that was quite interesting dealing not only with the technology, but also the, the people, the culture. So we go through a process of uh, um, bringing the organizations or these groups together and taking really looking at their point of views, their job task, what they're responsibility, responsible for, and, and coming up to an area where we bridge the gap. You know, every there's some thought out there to have an air gap between OT and IT, right, regarding in that regard. Well, uh, yeah, you know, some organizations might stick to that, but really it, there's a convergence that's taking place. And so for the, um, in specifically answering the question regarding the OT and the IT resources, I would say this, really use the technology where it makes sense. Use the, you know, resources. Really, is it more of an undertaking to add more individuals? Maybe here and there, but really it's a matter of using the technology um, to provide efficiencies uh, within the, um, the organization so that you can actually take advantage of really what the holy grail is, and that is information. Information's everything. This data, it's, it's key. What do you do with the data? And so do you use AI ML to help um, you know, aggregate that data, analyze that data? Of course you do, but how do you go about it? What resources do you need regarding that? Do you have a team in place that does it? Do you have a data scientist in place that can help you go through that? Do you have organizations that can analyze that data and produce things that make sense to the business. It all ties back to the business. So getting back to my first answer right there really depends, but I would say this, you need to align your business resources to and the technology together where it makes sense. Well, I, I, I think uh, also what some of the issues around IT and OT convergence um, uh, I, I think there are a few strategies that, that people are, uh, are taking. Um, let's go a little bit beyond some of the, the human factors that, uh, issues that I'm, I'm actually intensely uh, interested in because I think, uh, uh, again, we're not going to get uh, real secure systems unless people know how to use them. Uh, and understand that what's going on. And there's uh, a lot of technology out there that could help uh, if it's properly uh, coordinated. Um, some of the things that um, I think have been somewhat effective uh, in the consumer area um, with some of the mobile operating system uh, um, techniques for explicitly controlling interfaces, what, what, um, what app can have access to what uh, the, uh, aspects, what resources on your uh, mobile phone. Um, people actually use those things and, uh, and they were aware of them. And that actually has been one of the more effective uh, introductions of security and privacy uh, that you know, I, can, I can recall over you know, four years in, in, in this business. Um, and that's kind of uh, that, that approach of explicitly controlling interfaces uh, is one of the approaches that uh, is uh, you know, recommended in, in what, what's uh, in some of the, uh, the uh, 
work that, that NIST is doing, and in particular in the 8259A capabilities uh, inventory, where uh, they recommend that every device you, you look at all of the different resources and have access control for the interfaces for each of those inter, uh, uh, inter, uh, each of those resources. Um, that's something that, you know, for legacy devices uh, is probably not in the cards, <laughs> but- uh, Yeah, uh, not for a while anyway. <laughs> yes, uh, but, but I think pe obviously people can, you know, start, you know, doing those kinds of things. In some ways you can use a, 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 a gateway approach uh, for isolating in a lot of places that doesn't really work. Um, I like the area of, uh, or the approach of, using the concept of digital twins as a security device, uh, whereby uh, you have um, a way in which uh, people can, uh, you know, with the right permissions, can take a look at a set of devices uh, on a, uh, a, an operations panel and actually see uh, information that's coming from those devices to a secure point in the cloud. Uh, at least to be able to observe what's going on. Uh, and that secure point doesn't redistribute information except through, again, very, very explicitly con uh, controlled interfaces. Um, at at Intertrust, we call it, um, these things explicit uh, private networks, where uh, it's, again, it's not a, a communications uh, 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 technology kind of uh, uh, approach, but more of the zero trust approach whereby, again, every explicit interface is accounted for and every explicit interface has a set of permissions and also uh, a way of, uh, of uh, providing a, uh, a, secure, a secure connection between those interfaces and the actors who want to act upon them. So yeah, there's, in the there's, case, there's, yeah. No, there's, there's no, actually right. in, on that private network side right now, we haven't even gotten into the whole private 5G you know, talking about those entry points, right? I mean, that's another discussion for another time. But regarding where you were talking about the uh, the, the use case there, for us, we, we deal in digital twins, augmented reality, virtual reality ourselves. We have a use case is really um, in an industrial environment, what, what called a connected worker, where there's um, a headset, if you will, that uh, an individual would work, uh, use not only for safety biometrics, but also for you know, down worker, but also if they walk up to a sensor or a device, let's say a um, um, uh, a, a, a turbine, if you will, the ability to project you know information about that you know the status of that um, uh, device itself, but also being projecting back into the control room. So you can possibly have a junior person out there in the field. They're looking at the device. They're communicating backwards to uh, or back to the to, to the network operating system or the, the, the um, control center, I should say. And then you have more of a senior person and that person could be around the world. They don't have to be like right there on the plant, but securing that communication is really key, but also providing that capability where information is projected to the individual right there at that moment in time. And so you have that mobility um, of the person or the individual, but also the pre presentation of the information itself. So we do quite a bit of that. Yeah, Ellen, in in the area of uh, of um, privacy, um, and, and we we were just talking about George was in particular talking about uh, having a sort of uh, you could think of performance aids for people to understand, uh, you know, how things are are connected or when new new information is is available to them, having notifications that are well directed, those kinds of things. And and in the privacy area, do we have those kinds of performance aids, the visuals to to really illustrate to people, you know, what's going on, especially with respect to privacy vulnerability? Um, so you know, there are a few. Um third party tools that have developed, which um, allow you to sort of integrate with a series of APIs. Um, so for example, let's say if you have some data that you have marked that should not be accessed by the systems and somehow it accidentally is, 
you know, that there could be a letting on that or have data that crosses certain geographic boundaries and that wasn't meant to, you could also have alerting on that. Um, and also just even just specific users, you know, having access, um, you know, from a, from a role-based access control, but also from a data minimization standpoint um, to be able to, you know, put those sorts of controls. So some of the same things that are being for security could also be, if you will, um, be looked at in a slightly different context, but using the same controls, but just for the slight spin on it, it'd be much more privacy centric. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think there are some, you know, somewhat, you know, simple things that could be built in. Again, that has to do with uh, the whole sort of privacy by design and security by design. I just checked the time when we only have about three minutes and I wanted to ask a question <laughs> about uh, uh, about AI uh, and uh, uh, machine learning and its impact here. Um, and uh, perhaps, George, you could tell us a little bit about your point of view of how those uh, technologies can, can, can help uh, us solve some of the problems we've been talking about. Yeah, so I mean, like I alluded to earlier, and really it's, it's uh, you've got all these uh, entry points and points of um, information and so it's really gathering all this information and really it's that's one thing but what what do you do with it how do you how do you massage that information how do you you know do you send all the information back to the the endpoint if you will or the head end if you um or do you are there technologies that can you know have edge unit devices that can do a lot of calculations and save a lot of the the bandwidth if you will um, and calculations and, and uh, CPU usage on, on whether it's either in your data center or in the cloud itself. So really it's a matter of you know, taking advantage of that. And there are devices out there and we currently use a couple of them where as being a system integrator where that, that capability is at the edge and then uh, it's shared with the, uh, within the data center itself. But uh, taking that information and applying it is key. Because that having the information, the key thing is what do you do with the information now? It's a simplistic statement, but it's really that's the holy grail. If the information is a, of not value, then why are we doing this? And sometimes you can have too much information, so it can become murky or cloudy. If you can't um, dissect that information and use it um, in an efficient way, there's no use in getting that information. So. Um, it's really, once again, it all goes back to the business. How does it, how does it help your business and how does it help the bottom line? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, 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 in the area of AI, I am seeing that there are a bunch of companies that are emerging uh, that are in the business of collecting a lot of uh, network activity and extending that out into the IoT space is going to be interesting because, like I said, there's going to be enormous amounts of data. Uh, in fact, not is going to be there is enormous amounts of data uh, and they can be made useful and so uh, i i think uh i mean what the ai people are want to do is they want to take that data as to establish normal patterns of behavior so that they can detect anomalies uh security anomalies in particular but uh, I think we have the uh, hook coming in. Um, <laughs> from, <laughs> Kevin. Uh, so, uh, and we're right at 11.30. And uh, I have to say, I really enjoyed this uh, with all of you. And it, 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 it's been great. Uh, Kevin, Can do you I want to wrap us up? 